Hello, I am Daisha Williams. I am interviewing Colonel Christine Knighton on behalf of the Veterans History Project for Prince George's Community College in cooperation with the Office of Congresswoman Donna L. Edwards and the Library of Congress. Today is September 26, 2014. We are located in the television studio of Prince George's Community College in Largo, Maryland. Included in the room are the camera operators, Maximino Ruiz, Atalahi Aero, and Jacqueline DeShields. The project coordinators are Professors Teresa Dalvest, Louis Roden, and Dr. Sherelle Williams. The purpose of the interview is to gain insight into the life of United States military veterans currently residing in the state of Maryland. Thank you for joining us today. Yep, thank you for having me. So how's your day so far? Today's going great. Okay. How would you like for me to address you? Uh, it's up to you, Colonel Knighton, uh, Nikki is fine. Okay. Uh, so your name, Christine B. Knighton, but you introduce yourself as Nikki. Um, where exactly did that nickname come from? Right, so yes, my Christian name is Christine. Uh, last name, of course, is Knighton. But all my life I've been known as Nikki. I grew up in Georgia, so uh, if you know anything about people that grew up in the South, they usually had two names, their Christian name uh, and the name that everyone knew them by. So I've been called Nikki all my life. Okay, Georgia, the peach state. Yes. <laughs> Do you feel you had any advantages or disadvantages growing up in Georgia? Uh, I grew up in Georgia in the 60s and the 70s, so it was very typical of life in the South during the time that I was growing up, of course. Uh, until I was, I was seventh grade, we went to schools that were segregated, right? So I went to all black, uh, elementary schools up until seventh grade and junior high school is when the schools uh, integrated. So I'm thankful for that experience now. I probably wasn't thankful for it at the time that we were going through it and probably felt somewhat disadvantaged. But as I look back on uh, my upbringing now, I think that I'm a stronger person for having had that experience and that I'm a better person for having had those, those experiences as well. Okay. What are some of your fondest memories of childhood? Uh, my fondest memories of childhood are my childhood family and friends. So uh, family meant everything. Uh, there wasn't a lot in the way of entertainment. You know, there was not much in the way of movie theaters or what we have now in terms of DVDs or, or, or television, right? I can remember when we actually got our first television. So. It was uh, a lot of entertainment of, around family and kids. We entertained ourselves. So uh, spent a lot of time outside in the wide open, a uh, very rural area. So I'm very uh, thankful ha for having had the experience that I had of growing up in the Deep South and in a very rural area around loving family and friends. Okay. okay. What were your parents like? Uh, I grew up in a single parent household, so I grew up with my mom and we lived with my grandparents uh, for a very long time. I would spend my summers with my dad, but spent, my, uh, spent the rest of the time with my mother and, uh, and my uh, grandparents. So uh, it, just a, a great household, right? Uh, my grandfather was a very, very loving uh, fatherly figure to my my uh, my mother and her three girls. So there was no lack of male involvement in our lives as I grew up. But I was also very close to my father as well. Constant communication with him, and of course, spending the summers with him. Okay. Did either of your parents serve in the military? Uh, neither of my parents served in the military. My mother wanted to be uh, in the Women's Army Corps, as she referred to it, and it was called then the WAC. Right, Women's Army Corps, uh, but never, uh, never did that. Right, exactly. I guess you know, three girls came along, so <laughs> that can somewhat alter your plans. But I always remember that uh, it wasn't my, 
ambition to join the Army or be in the Army. It was something that worked out for me once I attended college. Okay. What town did you grow up? I grew up, I was born in a very, very small town, and even by rural standards. A little town called Benevolence is where I was born. Uh, I wasn't born in a hospital. I was born, I was delivered by a midwife who was my grandfather's aunt, actually. So all three of us, all, my, me and my two sisters were all delivered by the same uh, midwife in this small town of uh, Benevolence, Georgia. Um, so uh, it, we moved to the city, right, if you want to call it that, which was a town of about 1,500 people probably nowadays, probably about 2,500 on a good day. So we moved to a town called Cuthbert, Georgia, and that's where I graduated from, from high school. And you say you do have siblings. Yes, I do, okay. right. I have three brothers and I have, th I have two sisters. So okay. a total of, there are a total of six of us. Okay, what's your birth order? I'm the eldest of all six, oh, right, wow. exactly. So, right, so I'm the big sister too to both the boys and to the girls, so I am big sister. <laughs> so you said your mom wanted to serve in the military, but she, she didn't get a chance to. What do you think stopped her? Or? Right, well, my mom was 17 and a junior in high school when I was born, so I think me coming along kind of altered some of her, her life plans, so she devoted her time to, to being a mother or daughter and working to make a life for us. Any of your other siblings served? I my I have a brother who served right uh, and made E five right in the uh, army right so he was a sergeant. Uh, I worked in aviation as a pilot and he worked in aviation as a mechanic and we were fortunate enough to be on active duty during the same time. He spent most All of right. his time in Germany. I had a deployment to Germany and actually was able to link up with him in Germany during oh, that time. That's nice. yeah. What high school did you attend? I attended a high school called Randolph County Comprehensive High School. So it was comprehensive in nature because it included both, both vocational as well as your academics, your arts and sciences uh, as well. So, and I graduated in 1975. Okay. Was your school integrated, your high school? The high school was integrated, right. We integrated uh, when I was seventh grade. Uh, even though uh, integration took place, there were private schools that were in the area in the South uh, that a lot of the Caucasian kids would attend. So uh, the majority of the students in the school, even though officially integrated, were, you know, were majority African American. What were some of your closest friends like? Uh, my closest friends were Group were in my neighborhood, uh, more or less. Uh, we were close, uh, some were family, all right. Uh, my last name, Knighton, I didn't realize that it was somewhat odd until I left the area mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of my friends and families uh, had that same last name. Um, they were athletes a lot, you know, played basketball. When you're in a, in a rural area like that, the majority, uh, you know, you have to entertain yourself, so. Uh, Athletics was a way of, um, of entertaining. So a lot of my friends were on the girls' basketball team, uh, on the girls' softball team, right? Uh, ran uh, track and field. Uh, but I also had a lot of friends that were really good in academics as well and were able to balance both the sports and the academics. So. Okay. Are you still in contact with most of your friends from high school? I am in contact with a lot of my friends from high school, and thanks to Facebook, right, that, <laughs> is, that has helped out a lot. I'm able to, you know, stay in, in weekly communications with people that I hadn't had communications with, uh, you know, over a course of several years. So uh, we still do high school reunions. Usually it's more than one class, right, that is doing this combined high school reunion. So I look forward to reconnecting with them periodically about every five years at the high school reunions. Okay. Would you say that most of your closest friends became as successful as you? Uh, I say they are successful and it's according to how you 
define success. Success is defined in a, in a lot of different ways, right? I think, you know, you have to have your own personal definition of what success means to you. I have a lot of friends that are very, very successful as being parents, and that's what they wanted to do. Uh, I have other friends that have gone on and developed their careers in the military or in business, uh, engineers, or, and, you know, and they define that that role for themselves and, and they're successful. So I would say I have a lot of friends that are, are very, very successful. What do you feel successful is? Uh, again, like I said, you gotta define it for yourself and I think it's changing, it changes, right? I don't think you, you know, just set one goal and once you reach that goal, then okay, now I'm a success, now what? So, you know, I believe in setting, you know, short-term goals, intermediate goals, and long-range goals. Uh, you, reach your, you reach each of those stages of success, right? So, to me, that's success. That is, is changing and doing the things that you want to do when you want to do them. Yeah, success for me, you know, my biggest success, I think, is being a, a good mother and being a great wife. You know, other, although I've done some other things. <laughs> But my personal definition of success is those are the things that, you know, I don't want to compromise uh, and that, you know, I, don't, I never want to fail at. So uh, being successful in those two arenas are the things that I, I, I want to be successful at. I want to be a good person. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good sister. So, you know, I want, to be, I want to be a good daughter to, you know, my father. Um, so your, it's a personal definition of success and, you, and it, it's different avenues of how you want to look at your, your level of success. Mm -hmm. What was your most memorable moment in high school? My most memorable moment in high school? I have lots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably one of my most memorable ones was probably not, not a good one if you look at it. It was not making the high school basketball team. Oh. So my mom played basketball and she was a basketball star, right? And I was the oldest of her three girls and she expected her girls to be as successful as she was, right, at the sport of basketball. Not, not for me, right, exactly. So I didn't make the basketball team. I think that was ninth grade, right? But I ended up being a very successful trainer or as they would say in my hometown, I was the best water girl they had ever seen. Okay. Did you go to college right out of high school or did you join the military? I did go to college right out of uh, high school. Uh, I only applied to one college, right? I, um, during my senior year, I worked in the guidance counselor's office and in the library. So I did a lot of research on what I wanted to do next and where I wanted to go. So I had done a lot of research on Tuskegee Institute at the time, now Tuskegee University. So it was the only college that I applied to, right? And fortunately, I got accepted to the one college that I applied to and I went, I graduated from high school in May and went to college in August of the same year. Which branch did you serve? I served in the Army. Okay. Right. What made you decide that the Army was for you? Uh, you know, when I went to college I wasn't sure. I knew that ROTC was a possibility and that at Tuskegee there was both Army and Air Force ROTC. So I actually went to college thinking that I may give Air Force ROTC a try, but in their recruiting efforts, the Army were the most aggressive of the two ROTC programs, uh, and the uniform looked a little bit better than the, <laughs> than the Air Force. I know that seems a little vain, right? Not okay. Exactly, but uh, so that's how I ended up in the Army ROTC. And I, initially, I just did it to do the additional credit. So I, I did it as an elective, and had, at that time, I had no ambition of joining the Army long term or becoming an Army officer. How long did you serve? I served in the Army for 29 and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Where'd you begin training? Uh, training actually begins when you're in college. So my freshman year of college, we do what's referred to as leadership one-on-one. -on -one. So, that's when I got my first official leadership training. Other than, you know, in high school being uh, an officer of organizations like Future Business Leaders of America, Home Economics of, uh, Association of America, et cetera. But I think my first official leadership training 
uh, started in Army ROTC. And so after, the, after ROTC, do between your, your junior and senior year, you go off for your official training, uh, summer camp is what it's referred to. Mm -hmm. And that took place at Fort Riley, Kansas. Upon graduation, there's still additional training. So the way the Army education system is set up and most of the military education systems is that you become lifelong learners, that you never know everything that you need to know, so your education is continuous. In the beginning, at any time, did you say, what have I gotten myself into? I, I think, you know, probably a couple of times I don't feel exercises, right? And we did orienteering, which is like map reading. Uh, and if you couldn't read a map and you got put, you know, out in the middle of a forest or <laughs> the middle of the woods you're, and you're lost, you got a compass and a map and you, uh, yeah, there's a there's several times that you think, oh, oh my God, what have I got myself into? Is this something I really want to do? And of course, this was before the days of GPS, right, and Google Maps, yeah. <laughs> where you could find your your way out of anything almost now. But yeah, it was pretty much dead reckoning. So I think those were you know the most one of the times that I thought, okay, what have I got myself into? Uh, Doing a training, which is pretty, pretty uh, demanding. You, know, you think a, a few times too, like, wow, is this really something I want to do? But at the same time, you know, it's only temporary, right? So it's sort of like basic training and you know that there is an end in sight. How close have you came to quitting? Hmm, that's a very good question. I don't think I've ever come close to quitting. I think doing, um, doing flight training there are times that people really want you to quit mm -hmm. or they try to push you to the point that you want to quit but uh, I've never given up on anything I think that I tried to do even like I said since I didn't make the basketball team I was still affiliated yeah. with the basketball team by um, you know working as a trainer so I've never abandoned anything okay. right so even with the military, right? I wasn't gonna abandon flight school or anything else that uh, I attempted while uh, serving on military duty. Were you trained in an all-female camp? No, uh, there was the Women's Army Corps that I mentioned, but I think in 1975 is when they disbanded the Women's Army Corps and they started to integrate women's training along with the training for for men, so the, all the training that I did uh, was co-ed training, right, my entire uh, military career. What was that like, co-ed training? Co-ed training was good, I mean, and it became second nature to me. I can remember once I got to uh, training at Fort Lee, Virginia, one of my first tent mates was a male, and I thought nothing of it, you know, until someone brought it to, and I don't think he thought anything of it until somebody brought it to our attention. But, you know, hey, I was just knighting and I won't call his last name out of, a, uh, you know, for fear of embarrassment. But, uh, you know, but right, we it was just nature. He, you know, he was an army officer. I was an army officer. We had one half of a tent that we had to share with the partner. And the way that it worked out is, you know, there was no one left and we, we shared a tent, so. All right, so co-ed training is something that I've been accustomed to for the most part in my entire military career from the very beginning. Okay. I've heard that boot camp can be really tough. What do you think prepared you best for surviving it? Uh, boot camp is a little bit different, I think, for officers than it is for enlisted uh, personnel. Uh, you know, it's not the drill sergeant in your face screaming the way that you see it on officer and a gentleman right so it, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit easier i think uh, and not quite as challenging uh, when you go through army rotc training so where did you go from your training location uh, from the training location i went by, back to rotc for my senior year so after the initial training and so then i received my commission after uh, my senior year of college, actually received the ROTC commission, got commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army on the same day that I graduated from college. And from there, it was off to 
training, my specialty training, which is more like technical training at Fort Lee, Virginia. Do you remember most of your instructors? Uh, my ROTC instructors, I do, right, and it was one of my ROTC instructors or a couple of them that were Army aviators, right, and I, I inquired with them about aviation, what it was like to fly, the process for applying for a flight school, uh, and I remember them uh, very well. I, my professor of military science, uh, which was a uh, lieutenant colonel at the time and, and got promoted to colonel also, Colonel Guest, uh, Major Harold Marshallais, who was later promoted to lieutenant colonel, was very, very instrumental in, uh, in me getting, uh, in getting to flight school. He was one of the, one of the first white um, ROTC instructors at Tuskegee. Right, he was an infantryman, but also an aviator as well. And when I expressed to him my desire to go to flight school, he was, uh, my classmates didn't take me seriously, but he took me seriously and assured that I was able to do everything that I, ne I needed to do and take all the tests that I needed to take in order to, uh, to gain interest in the flight school. Um. Do you feel he had the biggest impact on your life? I don't know if I would say the biggest impact on my life. Of but, all your instructors. Right. Um, I, I think that he was very influential uh, in, in doing so. There were several other instructors that played a role uh, by, uh, by other means also. But I think, you know, my biggest influence, even though it was, you know, the military, I think, was my mother. Right, when I told her I thought I wanted to go to flight school, you know, she didn't discourage me and didn't question, you know, is this something you really want to do? Um, even when I told her that I was going to accept the ROTC scholarship, she, you know, didn't say, well, I don't think the Army is the right place for you. Uh, uh, so I think, you know, her encouragement kind of uh, helped push me along too. But at the same time, she left it up to me, even though I was 17 years old, 18 years old when I was awarded the scholarship to, to make that decision because she knew that was something that I would have to live with. Although she encouraged you and she pushed you, do you feel that she was scared? I'm, I'm sure she was. I know uh, through the years, she paid very, very close attention to everything that was going on in the world. And I think she mainly paid close attention to that because she knew at any time that I could be in any one of those places. Mm -hmm. uh, but with the numerous deployments that I've had, <laughs> she was like, okay, can, can they just do something and you not go for once? <laughs> right, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think, you know, just like most parents are, they're concerned about the livelihood of their of their children, you know. A lot of people join the military for different reasons. You know, a lot never anticipated something like a 9-11 happening and us going to war and being at war, you know, for the length of time that we've, we've been at war. Uh, you know, some joined for the GI Bill. Oh, I just did this to get an education. I didn't know I was gonna end up in Iraq or Afghanistan, right? But you always have to know that there's that possibility that you could end up being deployed Right, and realizing the, the main reason uh, that you serve is to defend your country anywhere at any time. You mentioned earlier you have children. Have, has any of them served in the military? Right, I have one, okay. right, exactly. I have a son, right. He signed up for selective service just like every other 18-year-old has to sign up for selective service, but he's a college freshman, just graduated from high school right, uh, this year, right, back in the spring, and, uh, and he is two months into his freshman year of college. Okay. Yeah. So if he told you that he wanted to join the military, would you persuade him, or would you? I would not persuade or discourage. Okay. I would let him make his own decision. We uh, have ensured, my husband and I are both military, so, and between the two of us, we have close to 60 years, 59 and a half. Wow years of military service between the two of us and we think that's pretty good for one family of, of three. Yes. Right, exactly. So we leave that decision to him. He knows that ROTC is available to him. 
Uh, we've taken him on tours of the military academies, right? He's gone to briefings about the military academies. So he, he knew that that was an option that he could potentially pursue, but we wanted that final decision to be his because that's something that he would have to live with for the rest of his life. Okay. The first time you traveled in the military, how did you feel? The first time I traveled with the military, uh, was to go to summer camp for a long distance. You know, we had done some road trips doing orienteering across cross country orienteering, and most of that was by car. But my very, very first flight on an airplane was to go to Fort Riley, Kansas for summer camp. And I was, I was one scared little Georgia girl. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so uh, it was a very small airplane that took you from Columbus, Georgia to Atlanta to the big airport where the big airplanes were. Uh, and it was probably the bumpiest ride I'd ever had due to those afternoon thunderstorms that bump up, that pop up in Georgia. So I said, if I ever get on the ground, I'm not getting back on a plane again. All right, exactly. So all that happened, right, exactly. And then I come back from summer camp, and that's when I told my mom I wanted to fly. <laughs> and she knew how scared I was, right, when I left home. And then I come back home, you know, with a totally different perspective. Right after having been exposed to military helicopters, to pilots, and uh, and the uh, training that uh, we went through during that entire summer out at Fort Riley, Kansas. What was your favorite place that you visit? My favorite place that I visited, yeah, I spent uh, four years in Europe. Right, mm -hmm. Germany was where I was based, but. You know, unlike the States, you know, you drive a couple of hours and you're in a totally different country when you're in Europe. You know, you drive a couple of hours around here and you're still in the same state, mm -hmm. right? You know, that's just, right, you know, the United States. Uh, so I guess the diversity of Europe, you know, the different languages uh, in Europe, the different cultures, you know, between the countries there. So. We go from here to California, we're in the same country, speaking the same language, you know, pretty much understand American culture. But when you're in Europe, you know, you go like four or five hours away, you're in a different country, speaking a different language, and they have a totally different different culture. So, so I think the four years I spent in Europe, I actually did want to go to Europe when they offered it to me. I told them I hadn't seen half the United States yet. Right, and that Europe wasn't some place <laughs> I was interested in going right now. Yeah, I don't and think they I said, thank you very much, Miss Knight. <laughs> Second <laughs> Lieutenant, you are? Yeah, you're off to Europe. Uh, so I went to Europe uh, for a three-year tour. Uh, I thought I would be coming home quite often, right? I only came home twice in my first year, one for its regular scheduled leave, another time for emergency leave. And for three years, I did not come back to the United States. So I spent three years of working in Germany and Europe and traveling throughout uh, that area. So I think my, ex my early experience in Europe and the opportunities that it presented to travel was, uh, was probably some of my fondest memories. Okay. When you were in Europe, uh, what were your duties? Uh, when I was in Europe, I was in aviation also. So after I finished flight school, where you learn the basics, uh, basics of helicopter flying, I went to the maintenance officer course. And that com was comprised a test pilot course. So everything that they had taught me to do to a helicopter to keep it safe, uh, they teach you to reverse, right, when you're in the test pilot course. Mm -hmm. So I went to Europe as, uh, as a maintenance test pilot, and my job was to, to try to make a, a helicopter fail right after it came out of maintenance before we uh, gave it back to the line pilots. So as a commission officer too, not only do you get to fly, but you also get to lead. So I led, um, I, be, I was a platoon leader uh, at different levels. So for I was a section leader and I was also a staff officer uh, and a, lo a logistics staff officer uh, as well during uh, my four years in, uh, in, in Europe. Who would you say you were most honorable to work with? I, I would say, uh, you know, in America's sons and daughters, right? We are, we get sent some of America's best to be 
uh, in the military and the lead. And they have a lot of faith in their leadership, you know, and they expect great things. They expect you to take care of them. Uh, and that's probably been my, my fondest memory, my, the, the greatest thing that I've had the honor of serving, you know, those who are serving uh, their country. Uh, I, I can tell you one of my fondest memories is getting a phone call, you know, from a hospital. Uh, and, you know, where, you know, usually as a commander you get phone calls when, you know, your soldier is hospitalized. But he didn't list me as his commander. He listed me as his sister, oh. right, and as his next of kin, right. So that, that really is special, you know, when someone cares enough about you and that you've impacted their life enough that, you know, they, they look at you as, you know, not just being their leader, not just being their boss, but they consider themselves to be, you know, pretty, pretty close to you. And, and that to me is very, very special. Okay. What did you not enjoy about your assignment? Um, it's, it's hard to say because I've tried to make the best out of, you know, out of every experience that I've had. There's been some challenging times and I don't want to make it seem like, you know, it was all a bed of roses, that it was a cakewalk, right? But, you know, I tried to use all of those challenging experiences to, to make it better, you know, to make myself better and to make the entire situation better. And to stay focused on the main thing, you know, why you're there. There were some challenging days when I was going through flight training, right? And you know that there are people that don't want to see you succeed. So, right, when I was in flight school, there, there's a, the way you get evaluated, there are things called pink slips. And the thing is, you never want to get a pink slip after evaluation. You want to get that white slip, you know, that says, okay, I did okay today. And if you see the instructor pilot pull out that pink slip, right, that pad with the pink, oh my God, that's like your worst day ever. Right, so, you know, so I went in one day and I wasn't feeling that great. You know, it was winter, right, I, I caught, caught what I thought was a cold, ended up being a sinus infection, mm -hmm. right, exactly. And, and I told my instructor up front, like, you know, hey, right, i not feeling this good, that good today. I don't want to go on sick call because I don't want to get set back. So in flight school, you wear different color hats. So, you know, you're in the, in the class, right, my, my hat color was orange hat. So, and everybody says, keep that orange hat flying, you know. That's the motto, you know, you want to graduate with the same class that you came in with and keep that hat flying. So, traditionally, you get, and the rules were that if you get three pink, pink slips, you go up for a prog ride. So, you know, I didn't fly that bad, and I probably shouldn't have said anything to the instructor, but as soon as we got back, you know, out came the pink slip, oh, right, yeah. exactly. And then he told me that the flight commander wanted to see me. So I said, okay, that's kind of strange. You know, I only got one pink slip, you know, why would he want to see me? And they told me that I was going up for a prog ride the next day, right, exactly. You don't go for prog rides until you get three, three pink slips, slips. Okay. right, exactly. So I was being put up for a prog ride after my first pink slip. So, right, I went back and I talked to some people that were there to somewhat mentor us that, that were there, minority students going through the program. And they, you know, I called them on the phone and, and, said, and told them what had happened. They said, well, I just saw you yesterday and you told me things were fine, mm -hmm. right? What happened in the last 24 hours? I explained the situation and then they said, well, you don't sound very good, what's going on? And I said, well, you know, I've got a really bad cold. So they said, hey, go on a sick call tomorrow right, and let us figure out what's going on. So that was probably one of my most challenging times is, you know, I know nobody else was being put up for a prog ride after one pink slip, mm -hmm. right, exactly, but somehow the standards changed a little bit when it came to me, right, and, uh, and yeah, that didn't make me very happy. So we did, you know, I went on sick call and unfortunately was grounded for a couple of classes, so I got set back, not just one class, but two classes, right? And I joined another class. I flew with a new instructor who happened to be the flight commander, right? And he finished me up early. And I finished up my training up earlier than the rest of the class. He told me when I came back that there were new standards. He wasn't sure what happened in the last, last, last mm -hmm. class but, that I was in, but they didn't operate that way in his class, so, right. So that's why you feel you got the pink slip? 
Okay. Uh, well, uh, exactly. So, you know, it was some good old boys doing what good old boys do. Right. Exactly. In the heart of, you know, L.A. And when I say L.A., that means lower Alabama, because that's where the flight uh, training was taking place. So, right. I, like I said, I grew up in the South. I knew what they expect. So, again, right. Do you feel you were picked with because of the fact that you were a woman? I, I think so. You know, they, we could still name uh, pretty much all the women that had gone through flight school right at the time that I went to through. We, you know, we knew them, right? I know there were, were some guys who just wanted to see if women could fly, and especially if black women could fly. Because at the time that I entered flight school, there had not been an African-American woman to complete the training. Not that there had not been an African-American woman to attend the training, right? So there were two of us in training at the same time. There was Marce Marcella Ng, okay. who was a, a couple of classes ahead of me, right, exactly, and myself. So, right, we, know, we knew Marcella and myself that, you know, we had a lot riding on us, right, and that we, you know, we wanted to graduate, right, successfully, right, to kind of, you know, pave the way for those that we knew would be coming behind us. Is that why you were able to wear the aviator um, wing badge? Wing, yeah. Right, exactly. So, right, after you finish the nine months of training, so it's nine months of very, very comprehensive training that you go through. You fly at night, you fly with night vision goggles, you fly in the clouds, you know, you fly uh, straight, uh, straight uh, training, you know, instrument training as well as visual training, flight training. So. Right, exactly. And then after that period of time, you wear your aviation wings. And I was very, very fortunate that my mother was able to pin my aviation wings on, on my chest upon, at my graduation from flight school. You were the second African-American woman to be able to do that out of the Department of Defense. Correct? Right, exactly. Okay. The second in the Department of Defense. And I think the first from the state of Georgia the at the time. Georgia. Okay. 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 Yeah. Have you ever done anything in the line of duty that you later regretted? Have I ever done anything in the line of duty that I later regretted? It's a very good question. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, I'm somewhat of a risk taker, right? But, you know, I didn't do anything that was illegal, immoral, right? Exactly. I wouldn't want it done to me, mm -hmm. right? So I didn't do it to other people, right? We have rules, we have regulations that we go by, and I try not only to enforce those rules and regulations, but also to abide by those rules and regulations myself. Okay. What was the greatest risk that you took? I, I mean, I think every time you lift a helicopter off the ground, <laughs> exactly, you're pretty much taking a risk. I think one of the greatest risks I ever took was um, in Germany, uh, sometimes in the winter, uh, the weather will set in. We were, my, my uh, airfield was at the base of the Taunus Mountains. So there would be days that clouds would roll in and fog would set in that, you know, it was, it, and it would stay around for like a week or so. So, right, and when you can't get an aircraft off the ground to a flight, you know, it's called, you put it in a red X condition. So basically, you know, you can't, can't send it back out. So my maintenance crew has worked on this aircraft the weather has set in and we can't get it, you know, can't get it off for a test flight, can't get it off the ground. So we had a temporary break in the weather, right? So one of the assistants came and said, you know, hey, I think I was a captain at the time, Captain Knight, you know, uh, we, we got a break, let's go, you know, and test fly this aircraft. So I did it, right? We got off the ground, went out, did all of our checks and everything that we were supposed to do, came back, headed back to, towards the air, air field, and it was gone. Wow. <laughs> it was completely sucked in. The clouds had rolled in. The fog had set in, right? So the only thing that I could see was a small field, right, where we had a small base on the side of the mountain. And so I landed there, and the aircraft kind of wow. stayed there for a week until we could get it, right, from off the mountain back down to the airfield. Okay. What type of weapons were you trained to use? Uh, I you know, just personal weapons, right? The M16, which uh, is what you know we use for uh, for our personal weapon, but for um, 
for officers, right, and aviators, we carry a 45, right, and then the nine millimeter when the nine millimeters were introduced. So it was all for personal safety and protection. So we had uh, machine guns, right, that would be mounted to the aircraft, right, but uh, the ones that I was trained, and those, and our air crews would be trained on those, right, but I was trained just on weapons for personal protection. Okay. Do you have a favorite weapon? Uh, no, not really. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I used it for just for what it was meant to be for training purposes and for personal protection. You know, I'm not a real proponent of, uh, you know, having a whole lot of weapons around. Yeah. Did you personally get to meet the president? I have not personally met the president. Uh, I have came close to meeting Jimmy Carter once because, you know, I grew up in Georgia. He's from Georgia. Okay. Uh, I met uh, a cousin of his, right, exactly. We became very, very close in my travels. I, I stopped in at Plains, Georgia, right? I'd never stopped in Plains before, even though it was only a few miles from where I lived, which is where President Carter lived and grew up with. And I stopped in Carter's hardware store, right? And I met Ruth Carter, who was uh, one of President Carter's uh, cousin-in-laws, right, mm -hmm. and we developed a friendship and became pen pals up until the time that she passed away. So I did attend her 50th uh, wedding anniversary celebration, and we missed the president and his wife probably about five minutes, right, so did not get a chance to meet him. To meet him. I did get to shake hands with, uh, with President Clinton at the groundbreaking ceremony for the uh, World War II memorial. Uh, I was escorting one of the female veterans from the World War II era, and he came over to speak with her, right, and, uh, and I got a chance to shake his hand and stand beside him doing the plan of taps, right, so that's the closest I've ever come to, uh, to meeting and shaking hands with the president. Were yeah. you excited? It was very exciting, and I started thinking like, oh my God, where's the camera? <laughs> Were you nervous? <laughs> exactly. It was, a, of course, it was a, a little bit nervous, but I was very uh, excited that he recognized uh, uh, Charity Adams early, who was, uh, she was a World War II veteran and commanded a poster unit during World War II. And I was excited for her and that he remembered who she was because they had been on a program before. And not only that, that he cared enough, right, to seek her out and to come mm -hmm. over and speak to her. So it wasn't really about me doing it at that time. It was more about her and her service. And for me, that was her day, right? And I think, you know, him recognizing her really made her day. Okay. When exactly did your war service end? Uh, my, my service in the military ended in 2008. So uh, that was at the 20, I think 29 years and probably four months. So I just rounded off to say 29 and a half years. So, right, exactly. So uh, mandatory retirement is usually at 30 years. So I almost served 30 years. My husband just completed his full 30 years. So I, I retired from uh, active uh, military service in uh, 2008. Did you have any issues readjusting to civilian life? Uh, no, not at all. And I think, you know, because my husband was still military too, was still fil affiliated, uh, we, I retired here in the Washington, D.C. area, right? So a lot of my friends were still on active duty. A lot of people I associated with were still with the military and still are. Uh, and a lot of the work that I do now is inside the Pentagon. So. Right, so it's almost like I never left. I wanted to do something different, and I did. So I went to work in public education. I majored in home economics education, right? Thought someday I would always get back into education, but probably at the college level. And actually, you know, my goal was maybe do something at the community college level, uh, right? But I, um, I enrolled in a superintendent's training program uh, and went through that training while I was still on active duty in preparation for retirement. Uh, and after I retired in 2008, uh, and the reason I retired a little bit early, a little bit short of, uh, of the 30 year mark is that an opportunity came open for me uh, inside the public school system. How do you compare the military with home economics? 
Oh, now home economics is something that I love and I have a very, I have a passion for. Uh, and I think my next campaign, I'm going to work towards restoring home economics at high school. I was at Blue High School earlier this morning and, you know, they don't have a home economics program. Uh, in the regular curriculum, I understand they do do some, do some classes in the evening, some evening classes, right, in that regard. But uh, I be became a home economics uh, major because I was very impressed with my, my favorite teacher was my home economics teacher. I enjoyed working with my hand. That's probably where I got my first hand, eye, and foot coordination, you know, working on a sewing machine, which is very much needed when you're flying helicopters because you're using both hand and both feet all at the same time. Uh, so, uh, and so I, I think there is a, and it's a skill that you learn that you can take with you the rest of your life. It was, for me, not only was it fun when I was in high school, but it was, you know, economically rewarding in that I did a lot of sewing for other people Right, and they paid they paid me money, so that's how I had my extra money when I was uh, when I was growing up, and uh, also growing up in a single parent household with girls, you know, it was nothing for me to whip out prom dresses or whatever it was mm -hmm. that we needed for special occasions. So, right, um, I and it's just a little bit disheartening to me now that you know, it's sort of a lost art, a lost skill because uh, a lot of students are not getting it now. Yeah. But I think, you know, and I know that this, this uh, college has a culinary arts program, mm -hmm. so I'm glad to see that that part of it is starting to come back. Uh, I love the Food Network. I know other people who consider themselves foodies, too. Yeah. So, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, great. So, you know, I, I think it all starts, like, when you're in junior high school, right, middle school, and in high school, and I would like to see it, it come back. But it's a skill that I think I, I can use no matter what, no matter, no matter where I am. So, you know, my, some of my friends were, refer to me sometimes as the flying gourmet. So, uh. so describe your life since separating from the military. Uh, my life since separated from the military has been uh, fun and adventurous, right? Not that it wasn't before. It was a lot of fun and adventure, and I think that's continue, has continued. All right, so, I mean, I enjoy doing what I do. What I do, I enjoy the time that I spend in public education, uh, and I enjoy what I'm doing now. Okay. What do you think was the most valuable thing that you got from being in the military? The most valuable thing that I got, the people that I met, the connections that you made. I mentioned that I spent four years in Germany, and I'm very, very close still to those people that I met in Germany, which was almost almost 30 years ago, right, exactly. You, uh, you meet people that become your family, like mm -hmm. family, uh, and friends for life, right? So that's been the most rewarding thing for me. And then the training that you get, you know, nowhere else could I have paid for the training that the military has afforded me, you know. Helicopter training on my own, there's no way I would have been able to get that on my own, so I'm very uh, fortunate for having had that opportunity. And the leadership training that you, you get while you're in the military is world class. I think it's the best in the world, right? I don't think you could get that, you know, right? We got some great universities with, you know, Harvard Business School, UVA, Stanford, right? But I think your hands-on experience that you get with your military training as far as leadership is, is world class and the best in the world. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about shape? Oh, shape, you've really done your homework. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Shape is a nonprofit organization that I started, uh, you know, just kind of, I was in, in career, had a lot of time to think, right? So, shape stands for self esteem, harmony, awareness, pride, and education. So, uh, you know, over the years, I, I've always uh, been challenged about, about, you know, how do I give back for those like me from my hometown and what can we do? Right, so once I got back from Korea, uh, um, I proposed this to my mom. We talked about it. You know, I talked to some other people that became founding members of the organization, and we introduced it to uh, my hometown. So it was to focus on exactly those five things, you know, self-esteem, you know, harmony, making sure you, you, you know, first of all, you know, 
being a good person yourself and knowing that you are, right, and having the confidence in yourself. The harmony piece, being able to get along with other people. Awareness, knowing that there's a world outside of, you know, the rural Cuthbert, Georgia, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, for me, the library gave that, made me my opportunity. The readings that I did let me know that there was a whole nother world, you know, outside of uh, my upbringing. Pride, having pride in what you do no matter what and where you are, and then the education piece. And like I said, you know, education is lifelong. It doesn't stop at high school. It doesn't stop at college. Yeah, you know, when you stop learning, you stop growing, right? You stop growing, you die. So, okay. right, education to me is very, very key. Okay. Yeah. How about winners? Winners. Winners is uh, when I left the school system after I, I left the military and did the two years in the school system. Uh, I came up with an LLC, which is winners, and it's about strategic planning right leadership and executive coaching so uh, that's my LLC my company that I own uh, and kind of my gift to the world you know for those who uh, who, who choose to employ me and, and my services uh, mostly focused on the executive coaching but strategic planning is also a large part of it okay what message would you like to leave for the future and future generations who will view this interview Wow, yeah, <laughs> wow, great question. Uh, uh, military service is awesome. Uh, I think, you know, there are, of course, you know, to, to kids who grew up like me and kids that are growing up like me uh, now, even now, there's a world of opportunities out there, right? But I think, you know, the military is still a good option. Uh, I, I say for them, even in the midst of everything that's, that's going on, right, it still affords you opportunities that you can never get any, anywhere else. Uh, the benefits to it, and not just monetary benefits, but the friendships that you make, the opportunities for travel that you get, the training that, that you get. Uh, and again, you know, from a financial perspective is, you know, my husband's retiring with 75 percent of his pay for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. You know, with at you know, with thirty years of service. Mine's a little bit less than that. But we're you know, as American citizens, we're pretty financially secure just based on uh, you know, on our military re retirement. So uh, so I would say, you know, the uh, I would I would like to say, you know, service in any form is good. Military service to me is even better, right? But find a way to serve. I think that we're all here to serve, right? I think that's our reason for being, uh, and that we all have to find our way of giving back, right, to, uh, to those who have given so much to us. Why is your pay less than your husband? Uh, because I didn't do the full 30, 30 years. years. Exactly, okay. right, I didn't do full 30 years, so mine's a little bit less. Okay. Not much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed that you would like to share? Oh, we've covered a lot, uh, <laughs> a lot of areas, right, exactly. So, I, I, and I just can't, you know, stress the importance of, uh, of education, you know, and being, like I said before, uh, being a lifelong learner. Uh, and those five things that, you know, I found shape around, I think, are so, such critical life skills, you know, self-esteem, harmony, awareness, pride, and education, I would just like to like to lead that. Okay. Thank you. It was my pleasure to have an opportunity to interview with you, a woman with so many great accomplishments and interesting stories. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the interview. This concludes our interview. I would like to thank you, Colonel Knighton. Thank you for taking your time to share your story for the Veterans History Project. <laughs>